Um, so this morning, I'm really excited to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Lewis, who is a research associate professor in the Network System Science and Advanced Computing Division at the Biocomplexity Institute at the University of Virginia. His research is focused on understanding and forecasting the transmission dynamics of infectious diseases. And uh, really, since I began my PhD and first met him, uh, Dr. Lewis has always uh, been on the front lines of mod modeling, working directly with decision makers responding to pressing uh, public policy questions. And, uh, you know, it doesn't surprise me that he's been at the center of a number of really important uh, works related to pressing public health needs uh, for SARS-CoV-2. So please join me in welcoming him this morning. Yeah, thanks a lot, Spencer. And it's really nice to be with you all. You know, I'm uh, always been a, a big admirer of the work that uh, Lauren does there. And it's always been fun. I mean, I think Spencer and I met at a Midas meeting. What? I mean, it's it's been a while, maybe a decade ago, plus easily. Um, and so uh, I've been a part of this community for, for quite a while. I'll give a little brief history of sort of my experience. And I'm mainly here to just sort of offer, you know, it, there, there is no textbook, I don't think, but I think we need to work towards that um, in terms of doing a better job of communicating these complicated infectious disease models that all of us on this call um, enjoy and uh, practice using um, with the decision makers and the public, et cetera. I think as, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why the communication uh, channels have broken down over the course of this uh, crisis. And so I'm just here to try and share a few of those, a uh, few of my experiences, and I'd love to hear back from you. So I don't intend to yammer for too long um, with the, um, I'm trying to share my window. Where have we got this? Got too many different presentations open and it has not given me what I want. Just a second. Do share screen. There it is, sorry. So let me go ahead and work through some slides just so there's a little bit of pictures for everyone to look at. So quick introduction, I'm at the Biocomplexity Institute at the University of Virginia. We used to be at the uh, Virginia Tech in the last three years right before COVID hit, uh, we had transitioned up to the University of Virginia here in Charlottesville. We basically focus on big data simulations, looking at socio-technical systems. We do some like power modeling, we do, um, a lot of other kinds of things other than infectious disease, but a big part of our portfolio has been focusing on public health response uh, with infectious disease modeling. We've been involved in the 2009 pandemic, um, influenza, Ebola, Zika, many, many others. The team is quite large. Um, if you ever find yourself in Virginia, come join us. This is our new building um, out here, the research park. Uh, I've been been pretty pretty good couple of years, but very, very busy. Um, initially, we worked with Midas. We did this pandemic influenza planning, then the H1N1 pandemic hit. Uh, There's a period of time where I was embedded with HHS uh, for BARDA after the initial sort of April teeny wave happened and then the big October wave happened. There's a lot of concern that in January, February, much like we're facing right now, that there might be another wave and how big would it be and um, what, what can we do about it? And so we did some third wave planning uh, and that was really interesting to be inside the government agency, getting their daily feedback and redoing the model runs, reanalyzing, re reconfiguring things. Uh, we were deeply involved in the West Africa Ebola outbreak. We've been working with DOD. Uh, they were charged with sort of some of the response, setting up these emergency um, Ebola treatment units. So we did a lot of different analyses and that was sort of on a weekly cadence uh, giving them updates and briefing uh, a lot of folks on that. So we got a lot of feedback on that. Um, we've been participating in the Influenza Forecasting Challenge, a sort of peacetime activity I think is really useful. I think informing influenza response is also extremely useful, but just sort of keeping the models exercising and keeping the community together, addressing questions and evolving has been really nice. And I think in some ways that activity helped make a lot of the teams that have participated and done a really good job with COVID uh, be, be ready for it. We've also done some, some work with IARPA where we did more data mining approaches like using satellite images and open table reservations to forecast flu. It's a little bit more cutting edge kind of not so useful but kind of intellectually interesting uh, challenges. And then this Ebola forecasting challenge, uh, I think I've seen some people trying to do this with COVID as well, basically trying to address the question of if we did have better data, 
would we have actually done a better job of using models to inform decisions along the way? And so they sort of set up a couple of scenarios where there was like limited data and then more detailed data, and then did the forecast and the uh, modeling efforts as we walk through time on those two different uh, levels of information, uh, did they do a better job of, of forecasting as well as just sort of informing decisions? And so I guess that gets us to the point of communication. In my view, there's three types of prognostications, if you want to use a fancy word for the business that uh, we often find ourselves in. Uh, forecasts, and I would define that as just sort of what you think will happen. You bake all your knowledge, qualitative, quantitative, into it to sort of say what's going to happen. It's like the weather forecasters, it's, it's going to snow tomorrow. Um, projections are sort of these what could happen under different conditions. I think that's what we find ourselves in a very uncertain uh, crisis like we're currently in where projections are maybe more useful to sort of look more long-term um, and sort of say, hey, if we keep the schools open, this might happen, but if we close the schools down, I think that's the kind of work uh, many of us do. And then the counterfactual is a little bit of a different take, but like what would be different if different actions were taken? They could also be future um, looking as well, uh, but basically there's all these trajectories and like if we had gone, if we'd taken that turn a little further back, where would I be now? Um, and so, I find it useful to sort of think about um, the situation that many of us have been in during this COVID-19 response, uh, to use an analogy, I don't know, one that has commonly been used in our group is about a car. And so you have a lot of decision makers, and basically they want to know what does the road look like ahead so that I can be ready for it. And as you know, like um, the models can sort of keep a situational awareness and they can project where the road might be leading us. But there's also other information that gets baked in there. Is it raining? What's the condition of the tires on the car? Can we hit the brakes? The last time we hit the brakes, did it work very well? And so you can say, you know, models can do a very good job saying, hey, you're heading into a turn, you need to hang, hang a left, but forecasting whether people are going to do that, how much they're going to push the brakes, whether the, the, the bald tires are going to come into play or not, or whether downshifting is going to do the trick. And so that's the challenge that we've often had. And so you often get these, we gotcha uh, things. I just saw something on Twitter about the scenario modeling hub that we've been uh, a part of for uh, a variety of many months now, um, where it was just sort of like our round eight projections came out, or maybe it was round seven, and it didn't anticipate the delta wave. You know, it's like, oh, well, look, there's this huge wave and your four month out forecast, you know, didn't catch the delta wave. And I think at the time that those projections were made, there had been only a few cases of Delta detected in the US, right? And so this is the classic modeler trying to explain it away. Um, but I think it's really important that when we provide these prognostications, um, these caveats about the conditions remaining the same are front and center. And that is really hard for people to uh, ingest, right? And so sometimes people would argue, you shouldn't even show these long-term projections. And the challenge that I, at least I've run into, and I'd be curious about uh, your experience, is that people always want them, even if they think that they're not going to be, uh, they, they say they understand they aren't going to be right. But once they then get out there into the public, then they can be used to sort of, you know, criticize or say that the model has uh, performed poorly. And so uh, the challenge with that, I guess, you know, is just you need to engage in this sort of constant communication. And we've been very lucky here in Virginia. Uh, to have that. And so part of our COVID response has been, um, you know, we went through the initial thing of the importation. I remember a lot of work uh, out of your group on some of these uh, parameter estimations early on. Um, been doing a county level, national and state level support now for a number of weeks. Um, right here, about 82 consistent weeks now um, with Virginia, where we do a daily churn, a weekly churn, we produce a slide deck and we've got a nice um, sort of a, a good faith broker and a point of contact at the Virginia Department of Health that we've developed a relationship over time who's sort of been the handler and semi-translator on the Virginia Department of Health side. Uh, and so that's been extremely, uh, extremely useful. Some of the other things that we've been involved in, because I don't want to take up all the time and get to some of the discussion part, is the forecasting hub. I think you guys may well have been participating in this for, for, for a while. We've been doing this since August. Um, the Scenario Modeling Hub is a nice group of folks. Um, 
mostly academic with some feedback from the CDC. We've done multiple rounds. We're about to submit the 10th round next week. This last round nine was actually maybe two or three slides in that ASIP meeting yesterday where they finally authorized the five to 11 year olds uh, and having two of those running around my house I had a little bit of a dog in that fight. So I was glad we were able to contribute one minor piece of evidence, uh, not that they really needed a modeling evidence to support that it was a reasonable idea. Um, and then the basic approach on this weekly update is we get data, we analyze it, summarize it uh, in multiple ways. A lot of these visuals, the visuals are really important, I think, although that's a little bit of a double-edged sword, uh, generate these short-term forecasts. We then scaffold projections on top of these short-term forecasts. So we have like a statistical model that says the next couple of weeks. We then say, okay, assuming those next couple of weeks are the same as ground truth, let's fit our um, mechanistic model and then arrange for different scenarios like this, things stay the same, things get as bad as last fall and winter. Um, we have a surge control where additional measures are taken into place or the weather, et cetera, uh, drives things down. And so we get then project forward with these different um, projections uh, and, and can provide evidence about what the different policies might have. Provide a lot of different outputs, deaths, hospitalizations, occupancy, um, take it down to the county level. This helps support a broad audience. And so we try and provide, you know, we brief um, every other week now. It used to be weekly, the local health district folks as well. So we'll get people on the call that are down here in the far Southwest uh, and Appalachia, as well as the sort of Northern Virginia folks and then the Tidewater folks. And so we have all these different audiences. And so we try and provide detailed data at their level. Um, always a trick trying to keep everything uh, uh, lined up and uh, the data feeds uh, smooth on all of that. So anyways, some of the communication challenges I've encountered is, you know, always designing these meaningful analyses and sort of anticipating the questions that the people that you're presenting this to, often they don't um, have the ability necessarily to ask the question or like what is um, on their mind until you sort of provide the straw man of it. And so that's always something that I think uh, engagement can really help with. And then choosing the right metrics and the visualizations, et cetera. And then the other part for us, at least as we've done this weekly, is just knowing when to sort of drop something. Just be like, you know, we aren't going to do this anymore. Or when to redesign it uh, or add in different new analyses. Uh, and that's always been a, a challenge. And so operationally, just making this happen in an automated way to the degree possible to make it so that it isn't a 60 or 70 hour exercise every week uh, to do this uh, has been a big part of it, as well as just finding an engaged collaborator. And I find that the news media sometimes can act as a good sounding board as well. I don't know what your all's experience with that as well. And so I'll just close. We can have five more minutes or so for discussion here if anyone has any questions or thoughts they want to throw in there. Uh, some, some communication nuggets. You know, a good analogy can go a really long way. I find communicating with folks. And if you can stick with that in regular conversation, and it's always hard to find that good analogy, it can be very useful. Visualization, visualizations can go even further. And I think, you know, Spencer, as you were showing, you know, having a good um, image uh, template that can be used over and over again is very useful and others can uh, take from, I think is useful. And then interactive dashboards can really help with this. And I know that Actually, you guys, I think at UD Austin, you were very early on able to do this um, um, before the software became so commoditized that it was uh, easier and easier for folks to do. So a good hat tip to you all for that. And then simplifying and aggregating the caveats. All these models have so much built in and assumptions built in. As scientists, we wanna put that up front, say under this condition, this condition, this condition, and assuming this, this, and this, then this is what might happen. Um, I think when you're communicating to decision makers, they, that loses them, right? And so simplifying or aggregating it, making sure that it can be provided later once the questions get to that level, but try not to bury the message. Although, you know, then you also sometimes, you know, open yourself up to, well, you said this would happen and you didn't say that, the, you know, the caveats don't get put in there as easily, but that balance I find is hard. The other part I think that's really key to this, and this is really, 
the job for all of us is sort of the education and the tutorials. Like most of the people we're talking to, they aren't stupid people. They just haven't been doing models for 20 years or something like that. And so letting them get um, a, a foothold into this world and understand some of the terms you're using can be really useful. Try to equip them to interpret what you're giving out as a result. And again, these interactive dashboards uh, when well designed can be really, really useful for that. So with that, I'll just, I'll just be quiet and close with like, I, I find that the news media, both local and national, can be a really important resource. Um, it is a little bit of a double-edged sword because it does open you up to some criticism perhaps on, on occasion, or they'll take the headline and say, you know, UVA modeler says everyone's going to die or something like that, which is always uncomfortable to be um, put into that role. Uh, but they often ask pointed questions and really challenge you. And they're good at communicating because that's their job. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that. I'm glad to sort of entertain any other discussion or questions. Thank you so much, Brian. So we actually have until um, 10, or, yeah, 1030 if oh, you okay. have I'm sorry. time, but, um, <laughs> but do you have to, do you have a hard stop at 10? Or no, I don't. I just miss, I think I just misread the uh, calendar invite. Sorry. Okay, no, no problem at all. Um, so are there uh, questions for Brian now? Yeah, if you want me to go back and elaborate anywhere else along like what we were doing is I did sort of shorten it to sort of fit into my perceived <laughs> window of time. Ryan, um, yeah. I don't really have a question, but I have a comment. I really appreciate your positive attitude toward people. You know, they're not stupid. They just haven't been educated about this because I think we need to remind ourselves of that. And I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, thanks. And like, I mean, I think the challenge that we found ourselves in in this crisis, I think that has um, perhaps been jading uh, and certainly um, I'm, I'm sure we've all absorbed some of this is that because it has become so politicized because it does affect so much, including people's ability to make money, which really gets people grumpy. Um, you know, there there is, a lot of agendas at play, right? And sometimes if your analysis doesn't play into that agenda, um, there can be sort of more deliberate and uh, uh, maybe bad faith interaction with um, with what you're trying to convey. And so that that is tricky. And I guess, yeah, I don't know how, how, how easy it is to always turn the other cheek and sort of continue with that sort of education when the person isn't necessarily operating in good faith. Um, but it's just the battle we've got to win, I think, through attrition. I mean, it's, there's a lot of other analogies, um, but it is tiring, I will admit. Brian, I'll read a, a comment from the, the chat. Oh. Um, we work with the city of Austin on thinking through events um, right now as, as we open up, which is a, a tightrope to walk between being the quote unquote crushers of fun and also keeping people safe. Have you found successful ways to communicate modeling or particular things to model that are, are most successful in kind of walking that tightrope? Yeah, that's a really tricky one. I think that was interesting. The, the, I think it was that Lancet paper that you had cited earlier, uh, Spencer, as well. Um, and in our experience, like, it's really tricky because they, like, I guess the decision makers often want the, the crystal ball. And in the analogy I was using before, like they wanna know what the road looks like. And they think that if they know what the road looks like, they can make a good decision. But if you only say, you know, the road is two lanes wide and you know, you're going 70 miles an hour and there's a turn ahead, but you probably can take that turn or whatever. If the information about like, and it's raining and your tires are bald, you know, they don't wanna hear that extra stuff, right? And so, what we always try and sort of lead towards is trying to provide that information, but let the people who are in charge of making the decisions to sort of decide when they need to step on the brakes or not. I mean, in terms of the, the concern about sort of uh, always being more conservative, like, you know, obviously the safer course is sort of, you know, well, let's just keep things closed down for another couple of weeks. Uh, it'll be better that way. 
uh, and it's more likely that we'll have success. One thing I guess I get, like to go back against that is one of the ways we've dealt with that, I guess, is the scenario and like try and build on people's past experience. And so this scenario that we made recently for the fall winter 2020, and we've done also some analytics that are sort of like, remember last year in the fall, remember that that was like pretty bad, at least here in Virginia, it was pretty bad. We were at a point where we got to uh, over a hundred per hundred K daily incidents for uh, a couple of weeks there. And we try and couch it in terms of that. So like if we saw transmission going on like that, which could again happen in the Thanksgiving timeframe, even if we correct for the vaccination and the low and the natural infections that have occurred over that time, this is what that scenario looks like. And I have I didn't bother to update these slides. This is from a couple uh, weeks ago. So I haven't updated with most recent update from the last week. So this curve is down a little bit, but this orange line sort of shows, you know, we're at this plateau and we could start going down here in Virginia, but it's still possible. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but these drivers still are out there. Um, and if we have a revisit of the transmission from the previous year, this is what the model at least thinks might happen. And I think sometimes um, couching it in that way can be useful. And I imagine that's what you guys are doing. Um, and I imagine it gets pretty detailed about like, well, can we let 50% of our clients into our restaurant or third or 20% or something like that. And that is um, very tricky to estimate exactly what the impact of that's going to be to do the cost benefit of like dollars in the pockets of the restaurateurs versus extra number of cases and hospital beds that that might uh, possibly fill. I don't have a good answer for that per se, but I, I find that if you can refer back to the past where everyone's comfortable with and have memory of, um, that can sometimes be useful um, instead of it just being sort of like my model has some squiggly lines out in the future and some of them look bad and some of them look good, um, but they don't have that sort of context to the to previous experience. People can dismiss them more, perhaps. I don't know if that helps. Thanks, Darlene. Yeah, hi, thanks for your talk today. Um, I have a question and um, about maybe some of the challenges you might have faced related to um, acquiring the data that you've used that have gone into your projections, either locally or nationally. So if you could speak to uh, those challenges related to acquisition and maybe also data quality or the type of data that are available to you um, from public health or, or other sources, that would be great. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, I'd be glad to share those. And I'm sure you guys have faced many of the same kinds of things, maybe part of the interest. And that's been part of the challenge as well um, from a technical point of view um, is that just always this thirst for new data and then having to vet it and then figure out if it's applicable and then trying to figure out how to like ingest it in a meaningful way. So the data we get, I mean, we, we did partner with VDH early on and they did actually put us under contract. And so that gave us a little bit of a, a foothold. It's still been a real challenge because the, like the Department of Health obviously has been extremely taxed from a personnel uh, point of view and all the various stresses that have come along with them um, sort of operationally supporting the response to this pandemic. And so they haven't been able to be super responsive but they did give us a little bit of extra insight to data that wasn't always publicly available after signing DUAs, et cetera. And so that's, uh, that's been a little bit useful. Sometimes it wasn't as useful. Some of the other information we've been using, like some of these survey things, I think COVIDcast, you know, the guys there at CMU have done a great job in uh, Maryland and pulling together some of these surveys and then also just sort of harmonizing uh, data access to some of the other publicly available things. Some of the challenges I'm sure you've run into is CDC, was very, very slow in releasing sort of like ground truth kind of data. And so we were using, um, shoot, I can't even remember the name of it, COVID tracker, I guess the, the one that was the citizen scientists and the journalists uh, that were just literally <laughs> data entering from the various state and local um, dashboards. Uh, so we were using that for a long time before CDC finally did it. And then as CDC's data became more stable and, DH and HHS's data became more stable, but then they'd introduce these changes to it. You know, we were using the Hopkins uh, data for case counts and hospitalizations for a while, but there's all these backfill issues that I'm sure have challenged things. And for our modeling, it, sometimes it was very, very sensitive to that. And so 
part of this redesigning I, I was alluding to before was sort of realizing that the data was always going to have these anomalies. And so we were doing this sort of very specific fitting process. And so we'd have these counties that would be like five, 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 200, 200, five, 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 and be like, what am I supposed to do? And like your model would be very messed up to try and fit <laughs> those kinds of uh, weeks. Uh, and it, you knew that wasn't necessarily real, but you didn't have the time to go into, you know, no offense, but often it was Texas or Oklahoma or Kansas that had these sort of weird anomalies in it. And you didn't have the time to go back in there and figure out like why it was 200 that particular week. And so we adjusted some of our modeling approaches to sort of do away with that or just sort of absorb it in a way that didn't mess up some of our other assumptions and just sort of basically ignore it to some degree. And so then that also creates problems down the line when you then look at cumulative counts and the reality, et cetera. Some of the other data sources, you know, obviously Google and some of the mobility um, stuff we were using early on, but then we found it didn't, it wasn't as useful because as people adopted mask wearing or curbside pickup and stuff, you'd see people going to the store, but they weren't really interacting. The, the number of transmission opportunities per travel unit, you know, was very, um, very heterogeneous over the course of this pandemic. Early on, it was like kind of a one-to-one -one, and then it turned into a one-to-ten. And then as things sort of reopened and people stopped wearing masks as much, turned back to like a one in five, you know. And so that, um, we sort of discounted that to, to some degree. And then as we got the variants coming in, and then as we got vaccination coming in, and now we have all the different kinds of vaccinations and different ages, um, and different mixing and matching now of the vaccine schedules. We try and incorporate all that, but we do make a lot of simplifying assumptions where you're just sort of like, you know, you're at the mRNA level of vaccination or you're at the non-mRNA uh, vaccination levels. You get boosted back to the original thing or you fade back down to a, a more moderate um, level. But we don't track, you know, I had a neighbor who said that they got J&J &J and then got boosted by Moderna. And there's like every combination is now uh, basically out there. And so we, we've sort of lumped those away, but we do track the, the vaccine thing, vaccination rates, and then have built models just to forecast what the future vaccination rates are going to be so that then our projections can incorporate that over time. And we actually just worked through a snafu this morning where we're trying to add in the children now that we know a more definitive timing of when the children would be added, um, what those look like. But then, you know, everybody changes their data formats again to have different columns and you do the, the Monday frenzy to get those all realigned uh, to look to get back into the, the modeling pipeline uh, that's been established. And so I don't know, those are just some of my experiences. I don't know if you had a particular kind of data that you're curious about, but that's sort of- No, a I think that's great. And thank you for, for that explanation of, of you know, the, the wide, um, range of challenges that you face. I think, you know, with the next pandemic, do you think we're better off given that we've, you know, forged all these collaborations between local public health and local universities and, and even with our national partners? Do you think there's some precedent now in place with all that sharing that's been done? Yeah, I, I really think so. And, you know, honestly, I kind of see what's currently going on as sort of a continuum of some of this work that many of us have either witnessed or been a part of or, uh, can dig back further. I remember in a lot of the early Midas meetings that I was at, there was um, Ira Longini, who's still active, but maybe a little bit less so, would always say like, we published a paper in 1978 about this, you know, and um, there is this sort of continuum, right? So the, there was this work on H1N1 that sort of started things, and that sort of set the ground for some of this influenza, oops, forecasting challenge uh, work. Um, and I think that sort of helped a little bit where we sort of normalized what data would be available and uh, what some basic approaches and metrics for analyzing these particular classes of models might be. Um, and I think now we, we are like we're actually going into now forecasting, um, forecasting the flu. And we're like, oh, my goodness, like, can you believe that before COVID, like we did, had state level weekly data that was lagged by 10 days. That was the best surveillance data. And it was an activity level. So it was a percent of like Sentinel surveillance sites, which you don't get to know about where they are necessarily. 
Like it was very, very, very coarse. And now here we are sitting here in COVID times where we have county level confirmed cases each day. Some weekends are now being skipped, et cetera. Um, hospitalization by facility, like the, the level of resolution of the data is still something I don't think anyone's fully grappled with how to fully effectively use yet since it's all been in this reactive crisis mode. Um, and so I do think that, you know, in the future, the inter integration that has sort of been achieved uh, to various degrees um, is going to be very helpful in the future. I hope that we don't have anything like this for quite a while. Um, and one other thing I would add is that this national forecasting center that has been uh, a part of sort of the community's efforts to sort of support and has been argued for um, off and on uh, for a while as most vociferously after the Ebola West Africa experience wish we could have gotten something a little bit more in place. Uh, things were set up to be in place, but we had a four year hiatus. I'm, I'm being concerned about pandemics. Um, but I think as that gets rolled out, I think that that might be a good nexus point. Um, and you know, we've got a bunch of colleagues that we've worked with over the time uh, in, in those seats. And I know that they're very interested in sort of fostering this collaboration. Caitlin Rivers actually got her PhD with us. She's one of the scientific advisors on that whole process. And I know Mark Lipsitch has been a long time Midas person. I think he really knows uh, at a deep level how important that integration is. And Dylan George also, long time guy that's been at a lot of these Midas meetings and been involved in this kind of work and really sort of understands the machinations on the government side, as well as what the academics are good at and not good at and how that integration can happen. And so I'm, I'm hopeful for the future.